Hi, welcome back. Let's do some chapter three as we move on a little bit here. We've moved, we're moving past the, uh, the Greek uh, era here, but we're still sticking into the time of some old, older philosophy. One of the things that we might want to kind of keep in mind is, is to understand uh, where philosophy went geographically speaking uh, and how that's tied to certain aspects of, uh, of of societal stuff. So, you know, to be a philosopher is a little bit of a luxury, especially in ancient times, right? That uh, you could make a living um, studying and exploring knowledge and teaching that to others um, rather than having to farm and, and take, and you know, fend for yourself, so to speak, in that way. Um, and that required, to some degree, some degree of centralized uh, wealth and and um, to, to to subsidize that kind of of academic pursuit. And so, in the golden age of Greece, it kind of made some sense that with the accumulated wealth in that society, that they were able to support those kinds of of activities. And the same goes for the uh, Roman Empire. And then. Uh, as we look kind of towards the, and so here we have some some Roman uh, f philosophy. There's not a lot of Roman philosophy, really, but there's some here. And then we have, um, after the fall of the Roman Empire, what, what we see is a, is a little change in philosophy, because what's happening is that... Um, the philosophies that we've been talking about here, uh, especially in chapter two, which are associated uh, pretty heavily with Plato, are, as we see, get bound up into early Catholic theology. And so philosophy survives, at least in the West, uh, as Catholicism spreads throughout Europe. And so as the monasteries are created, the monks can devote their time to uh, philosophy and theology and and so the the platonic philosophies that we have covered seem to be fairly easily uh, integrated into this early Catholic theology and it survives in this way uh, at least for several hundred years until Aristotle is rediscovered in the West as we're also going to see Aristotle's philosophy um, was largely forgotten in the West and but but was preserved in the Middle East through um, of Islamic philosophers, and it was after the Crusades that uh, Aristotle was rediscovered, and that knowledge was brought to the West, and it was really Aristotle's influence that sort of, um, I guess, signaled the beginning of something like the Renaissance in European history, and and there was a new philosophical movement that that really led to uh, the origins of science, even uh, in. Uh, the, the, the Renaissance era of, of uh, and the early modern era of European history. So let's first start though with what happened with Platonic philosophy in this uh, kind of post-Roman to post-Roman era here. So we have a couple of uh, what, are, what would be considered uh, Neoplatonist philosophies. So Neoplatonism refers to new Plato, right? So, so it's, it's it's when Platonic philosophy got uh, integrated with early uh, Christian and Catholic theology. And that comes from the Roman philosopher Plotinus, as well as uh, St. Paul, who wrote uh, many of the letters included in the Christian New Testament. Certain themes that we especially see in what we would call Pauline writings would be things like um, that the mind and uh, reason and kind of that more uh, abstract kind of stuff are associated with things that are good, but things associated with the body, sensual uh, things. Uh, and keep in mind the word sensual derives from the word senses, right? So a very kind of typical thing to think of here when we think back to the Greeks and how it was common for them to uh, distrust the senses and think that we don't get anything good from the senses. So that's associated with things that are bad. And then even with, with scent in early, uh, early Christianity. So we see a, a real uh, connection to the rationalist ideas of Plato, right? The idea is that the mind and reason, that's the 
true way of getting at knowledge and anything coming from the body or from the senses is not going to tell us anything about what's true and what's real and what's worthwhile for knowing. So again, this focus on inner knowledge, knowledge from, and keep in mind for Plato, when we get this word psyche from Plato, and it means uh, the, the mind, and that's the root of our field, psychology is the study of mind from, from Plato's term psyche. But Plato also intended this word to, uh, to mean the soul as well. And so that means this inner knowledge from the soul is our true path uh, of, for, to wisdom. And anything that takes you away from that would be considered false and sinful. So, so it makes some sense. And of course, you know, with this idea from Plato that the soul comes from the ethereal realm, it's, it's pretty reconcilable to the Christian idea of the soul coming from heaven. So you can see how kind of easy it was for, for the early uh, Christian thinkers to be influenced by this kind of platonic thinking. So let's take uh, one quick look at what Plotinus was talking about here. So it's consistent with this idea that the soul uh, and spirituality is, is the true form of reality, the true form of knowledge. Um, he creates a hierarchy. And so again, the, the, the top of the hierarchy is more of a spiritual reality and the, the bottom is the more physical kind of reality. So there's a kind of an implied dualism there too. And again, Plato was a dualist separating ethereal reality from physical reality. So Plotinus puts uh, God at the top of the hierarchy. So you have the one, note the capital O there, and it's, uh, that's the term that, that Plotinus was using. And it's a little reminiscent perhaps even of Parmenides with the idea of the universe being this eternal spherical one, right? The singular one. And then God at the top of the hierarchy, according to Plotinus, creates the universe by emanations. So emanations here refer to the emanating spirit. Um, and that from these emanations is first created closest to God is the, the human mind, which is the soul or psyche, again, for Plato. And what happens here, according to Plotinus, is that we can either turn our minds inward toward the spirit and that inner knowledge, or we can turn away from that in an almost literal way, turning away from that to then uh, see physical reality. So the idea here is that we create, in a way, the physical world as a product of our own minds, as a product of our own senses. By paying too much attention to the senses, we are attending more to a physical world, kind of turning our backs on that internal spirituality. So in, a, in something that's very reminiscent of Plato, the idea is that we should rather turn inwards, turn within ourselves to focus more on the inner spirit rather than on the external physical sensory created reality. Even though I did say that there's a hint of dualism here, I think one way to think of Plotinus is that this is perhaps properly seen as idealism because really everything is created from the mind, whether it's the mind of God or whether it's the mind of humans, it's, it's still created within the mind. Everything de depends on the presence of a mind in some way. So in that case, we would call this uh, idealism. So if we think back to our mind-body distinctions, We've talked about the fact that you could be a dualist and you have both mind, mental things, and body or physical things as two separate independent realities. But with monism, there's really just the one reality and you can be a, a physicalist or a materialist like uh, Democritus with his atoms, right? Or you can be an idealist and say, well, only the mind is real and the physical reality is very much just a thing that something that does not exist independent of mind, but depends on mind. You have to have mind in order for any other reality to exist. And so we would really call that idealism, to say that ideas in the mind are the real, ultimate, true basis of reality. So as I had mentioned, uh, Aristotle and the rediscovery of Aristotle triggers a new movement in uh, European history that we call scholasticism in philosophy. Uh, so, so first, the idea, of course, is that Aristotle's knowledge had been preserved in Islamic cultures through philosophers such as uh, Avicenna. So Avicenna was very much influenced by Aristotle. So we see, uh, just as Aristotle had talked about, uh, being born a blank slate with no innate knowledge, and that knowledge begins with uh, sensory knowledge, begins with experience, and then through induction. So remember, again, from chapter two, the difference between 
induction associated with empiricism and deduction associated with rationalism. Avicenna is talking about knowledge that is acquired inductively. So we start as a blank slate, we acquire experiences, and, and then we do something with those experiences to create knowledge inside of ourselves. And it's kind of a bottom-up approach to knowledge. So again, that distinction, uh, if you're familiar with modern cognitive psychological terms, bottom-up processing is, is associated with empiricism, top-down processing is more rationalist idea. So Avicenna gives us one of our very first cognitive psychological theories. So just like we have seen, uh, probably our first psychology theory was a perceptual theory coming from Democritus, which was a theory about uh, how knowledge works. So again, I think I emphasized in chapter two that it's not a coincidence that empiricists are giving us psychological theories. And in that case, Democritus gave us a perceptual theory. There's a little bit on, in, the, in the book, we didn't talk about it much in the lecture from Aristotle about learning, uh, the laws of association. And next we get Avicenna, who talks more about uh, kind of a stage-like theory of cognition that in many ways is, is reminiscent, is fairly similar to modern cognitive psychology theory. So the first stage we have here, we take in sensory information and we integrate that into what he calls the common sense. That's, a, that's perhaps a misleading term because when we use the word common sense now, we mean something pretty different uh, than what Avicenna meant. We think of just the everyday kind of knowledge, social knowledge, knowledge that we share with other people so that we're able to kind of communicate and interact successfully with others, right? That's common sense. But that means common in the sense that we all know it. Uh, here, common sense refers to the idea that if we think about you have at least your five senses. We'll go with that for now, right? We have your eyes, your ears, your, your skin for touch, taste, and smell, right? So vision, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. Each one of those would be an individual sensory system. But when we experience the world, we don't experience those five senses independently of each other. We experience them uh, in an integrated way, right? You, you see something and you touch it and it becomes just a singular object here. I can hold an object in my hand like this pen and I can see it and touch it at the same time, and it becomes a singular object. And that's because the touch experience and the visual experience have become integrated in common with each other. And that's what we mean here by the common sense, is that all of our sensory inputs are integrated into a single common perceptual whole or perceptual representation of an, ob of an object that we, that we are experiencing in any given moment. So that becomes the common sense, and therefore that becomes what we are aware of at the current moment. So we might equate this to something like attention or perhaps uh, working memory, but that also takes us to the next step as well, because then we have what he calls the retentive imagination. Here, imagination does not mean fantasizing, like we sometimes think of imagination now, but it really literally just means mental images, all right? Hence the word imagination refers to this internal mental imagery. So here the idea of course is that you can take an object like this pen and you can perceive it in, in many different ways and now you have a perceptual image of it, all right? And even when the pen's no longer visible, you can still have an image of it, right? So you have your, your mental representation or mental imagery. And that's what Avicenna means by imagination. And so the retentive imagination is essentially this perceptual imagery that we have that we are retaining in our mind at any given current moment. So this is very similar to what we nowadays call short-term memory or working memory, right? What the current content of your consciousness. We can now do things with that knowledge. We can associate it with other ideas. And that's also a job of working memory in, in modern psychology. But uh, here we see that uh, what Avicenna is doing is he's talking also about learning. And he was, he's also then uh, drawing on Aristotle's laws of association, the law of contiguity, that two things that occur at the same time will be associated with each other. And so he's, we're composing new ideas. And that's why it's called the compositive imagination, because we can create new thoughts, new ideas, and new concepts by connecting and associating one idea to another idea. We also have the ability to judge ideas. We can judge things as good and bad and true and false and so forth. 
And he calls this the estimative power of our minds. And to an extent, we see with that, uh, Avicenna here that he believes that this is at least in part an innate ability, that uh, our knowledge of good and bad, for example, and right and wrong, he would consider to be innate. And because uh, this morality is an important part of, of uh, the, the innate part of things that uh, Avicenna thinks that we should have. And then, interestingly enough, he says that we can take all of this knowledge, all of our perceptual experiences and all of the, the uh, connections and associations and things that we've learned and all of our judgments about things, and we can remember it all. We can store it in our long-term memory. So just like we now have a long-term memory idea in cognitive psychology, Avicenna also has basically the exact same idea. So we see here ideas that kind of memor mirror the if you know the three-stage theory of memory in cognitive psychology, that there's a sensory memory and then a short-term memory and then a long-term memory, we, something, we see something a lot like that here, right? The sensory information and the common sense is like the sensory memory and attention. And then retentive imagination is like short-term memory. Compositive imagination is working memory and learning. And long-term memory is long-term memory. And so as... as uh, Aristotle's ideas became uh, to, to come back to European philosophers and they rediscovered this and they start to, to kind of expand beyond the old Platonic ways of thinking. And as I had mentioned, we start to see the origins of science coming along and it's going to come from Galileo for the most part. It's going to be one of the key figures in the um, re kind of rediscovery of scientific approaches to things in, in European history. And it begins with this philosophical problem that we touched on, mostly in chapter one, just a little bit in chapter two about whether the universals are real or not. So, you know, the whole issue of what makes a dog a dog, right? And we can think about the fact that maybe there is something that makes a dog a dog in the terms of, in the terms of some essence that a dog has, right? So it has some essence some essential property that defines it as being a dog. Or back to the question of a perfect circle, right? We, we talk about these things as, well, I've never seen a perfect circle. So where does the idea of circularity come from? I have the idea of circularity in my mind. Where does it come from? That's, a, that's an epistemological question. Is it learned or is it innate, right? That's the epistemological side of empiricism versus rationalism. But separately is the question of whether or not it is even real in the first place. And, and that's a question for science and to some extent, because when we study things scientifically, we want to know, am I studying reality, right? Am I, sometimes we have to study things in, in science that we can't actually directly observe in some way, right? Physicists, for example, study uh, atoms and subatomic particles. No one can actually in any direct, immediate way perceive a, a, a boson, right? Like the Higgs boson that was a big deal in, in science and physics a few years ago. But rather what happens is that we do uh, experiments and we record some things and we get a lot of data and we look for patterns in the data and the physicist came to a statistical conclusion that their patterns of the data were consistent with what would be expected by the presence of a Higgs boson. But nevertheless, all the Higgs boson is in any given person's mind is nothing but a, an idea, a mathematical abstraction that, that uh, was inferred based on the mathematics and was then confirmed based on statistical analysis of some observations and particle collider experiments but we've never seen one. So just like we've never seen a perfect circle, we can ask, is it real? Does it exist? And like, just as we've never seen the Higgs boson, we could also then ask, is it real or is it just a mathematical abstraction? And in psychology, this becomes a, a particularly important issue because I have never seen, in another person at least, a mind. I have my own mental experiences, my own ideas and thoughts and feelings, but I can't really see the minds of others. So I could also be left with the question of, is the mind of another person even real? Uh, or, you know, so again, I can, I can study behavior and I can infer some things about the human mind based on my observation of behaviors in other people. But again, that begins the question, is it real or not? So that's the real issue here in the problem of universals. We have all these concepts, we have all these abstractions, perfection, infinity, 
essential things like the essence of dogness or the essence of circularity uh, or ideas in the mind at all and uh, whether they correspond to anything that's real. So let's, let's have a look. Well, one possibility comes from this guy, William of Ockham. So if we remember the, the two sides in the problem of universal are nominalism versus realism, right? Keep that separate from epistemology, that's empiricism versus rationalism. There are some parallels. As we see, empiricism and nominalism tend to be connected to each other. People who are empiricists also tend to be nominalists, but they're not the same thing. Empiricism means you're born a blank slate. Nominalism means that these ideas exist as names, as, as ideas in the mind, and that's all that they are. They don't correspond. They do not correspond to anything that's real that exists outside of the mind. And so William of Ockham gives us the famous Occam's razor, the idea of this, uh, you know, the simple way of thinking of it is just keep it simple, eliminate extraneous assumptions and unnecessary assumptions. Uh, it's also defined, as I have written it here, as do not multiply entities beyond necessity. And what that means is that if you have two entities and you don't need two entities, shave one off. That's why it's called the razor, as we shave off extraneous assumptions or extraneous entities. What do we mean by an entity here? Well, in the case of talking about ideas in the mind, such as the idea of perfect circularity, that's one entity. It's a thing, right? It's an idea. It, it's, it's, it is a thing, right? So that's one. The second entity would be the idea that in order to explain the idea of circularity in my mind, I would also have to invoke a real circle somewhere else outside of the mind. Plato, for example, said that there is a perfect, perfect form of circularity that also exists somewhere else beside the human mind, and that exists in an ethereal realm. So in that case, we have two entities, right? We've got the circle in the ethereal realm, and we have the circle in the mind. And Plato says that they are both necessary to explain uh, our knowledge. And what William of Ockham says, we don't. We don't need that extra circle. We don't need the one in the ethereal realm. He says that we, can, we could argue that I could, I could just figure out or infer the idea of cir circularity just through experience by looking at one imperfect circle and then another imperfect circle and then another. And that over a sufficient number of observations of all kinds of imperfect circles, I would get closer and closer to understanding what it is that they all have in common. And so I'm extract, abstracting out from those experiences the essence of all of those experiences, which would be the essence of circularity. And from there, I would be able to understand circularity uh, just based on imperfect experiences without there needing to be any kind of absolute circle somewhere else, such as in the ethereal realm. So in that case, the, the, the perfect circle becomes a, a, uh, an unnecessary entity. So we can take the razor and shave it off and we are left with just ideas in the mind. So in that case, that's what we're doing here. We can say that we, we, don't, we do not doubt that ideas exist in the mind, but we don't need any other entity to explain these ideas in the mind. We don't need this other external reality, right? So we can leave ourselves with just the ideas. That's nominalism. Now we might imagine that there's another ism that we might, might maybe start to think about if we really take this to an extreme, because does this really mean that we don't need any kind of reality outside of the mind? Are we talking about idealism here? That, that we can just get rid of an external physical reality or any other reality besides just what's going on in our own minds? And there's another ism here called skepticism. Right? Skepticism is the idea that I start to become skeptical about any kind of reality whatsoever outside of my own mind. And from a scientific perspective, we might not like skepticism. This means that all of our scientific knowledge doesn't really correspond to anything that's real, that physicists are not discovering the true properties of reality. They're just really creating abstractions and mathematics and, and, and theories that uh, all manage to be consistent with each other, but don't really correspond to any truth about the universe. And of course, that's what a universal is. It's meant to be a truth about the universe. But uh, if you're a nominalist, we might be led to the, have the conclusion that there are no truths of the universe. And um, 
that's what skepticism is all about, is that uh, I remain skeptical about the truth value of any statement that I might make about circles or dogs or people or atoms. So maybe we don't like that. So we're going to see somebody come along to try to uh, rebut what William of Ockham is, is saying here. So, so realism would be our alternative. So we're going to talk about first Plato again. And, and so Plato's not the rebuttal to, to William of Ockham, uh, but, but we're going to remember what Plato said. Plato was a realist, but there's another name for that. It's, it's uh, technically what Plato's uh, philosophy is called is exaggerated realism. The reason this is called exaggerated realism is just that it's an extreme version of realism. He's saying that for each idea we have in the mind, such as the concept of circularity, the concept of a dog or a cat or a squirrel, that, um, that, there, is, that there is something that corresponds to that in the ethereal realm, that there is in the ethereal realm the perfect form of dogness and the perfect form of catness and the perfect form of squirrelness and the perfect form of circularity. And so there's always two things. There always has to be two things, right? It's, there's always the idea and there's always the essence or form in the ethereal realm. And those essences or forms get to exist all by themselves and they're independent of everything else. They just get to have their own absolute existence all by themselves in that special realm. So that form of, of assigning an, uh, a true, total, independent reality to the essences or forms, that's why it's called exaggerated realism, because these forms get to maintain their own independent reality there. What we end up here in this reaction against uh, William of Ockham and Occam's Razor is what's called moderate realism. Moderate realism comes from uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. So he says that he's going to be a realist, and so hence why it's called realism. And it's, so the, when we say that, we're going to say that the universals exist as things outside of the mind, not just as, as ideas in the mind, like the nominalist ideas. But we're calling it moderate realism rather than exaggerated realism. And, and so what makes it moderate here? And what, what Aquinas is doing is he's taking the essences or the forms, and he's taking them out of the ethereal realm, and he's putting them into the physical realm with the objects themselves. So if we go back to this question, what is it that makes a dog a dog? Right? We have some trouble with that. We, we, we think, is it the four legs? Again, remember that for something to be a, a definitive of an essence, it has, to be, it has to have this quality of if and only if, right? A dog is a dog if and only if it has four legs. So, so that means that if an animal has four legs, it's a dog and not anything else. And we know that that's not true because cats have four legs, zebras have four legs, elephants have four legs. So that's not a characteristic that narrows everything down to a dog. And of course, if a dog were to have for some reason only three legs, it would still be a dog. Losing the leg doesn't, um, you know, take away its essence of being a dog, right? The same goes for having a tail or a fur coat, or a snout, or anything like that, right? So there's all these characteristics that might be something that a single dog will possess, but it, it's not a universal, right? It's not something that every dog necessarily possesses, at least not in the same way. So if you're, if you're William of Ockham, you would just say, well, Dogness is, a, is just a, a name, it's an idea, it's a category. You've seen a Great Dane, you've seen a Poodle, you've seen a Chihuahua, you've seen a German Shepherd, you've seen all these different breeds of dogs. They're all very different from each other, but over time you've been told that it, this is a dog and that's a dog and this is a dog. So you create through experience a, a, your own mental category, a label, a word that you learn to apply. We do this as young children when we learn the names for things. And we see that children will do things like make category errors sometimes. They will, they will learn the word dog, and then maybe for the first time in their life, they'll see a cat, and they will say, oh, this, that must be a dog too, so they'll call it a dog, and then, until they're corrected by their parents who say, no, no, that's a cat. And now it's like, oh, okay. So now there's two different kinds of things that have four legs and a fur coat and a tail and so forth, and that one's a cat and this one's a dog, and they have to figure out where these category boundaries are over time, they learn to do that so that they will 
correctly identify all of the various things that we call dog as a dog and all the various things that we call cat as a cat. But as far as a nominalist uh, like a com is concerned, we are just putting these categories uh, together in our minds. We are just forming associations and links between them in our minds and we're giving them names. And that's all that that is. It's, it's, it's just a, the culmination of human knowledge and we, we, we give a name to it, hence the, why it's called nominalism. Nom means name. And we share that with other people so that we can all now agree that we're all gonna call this group or this category of things by the same name. Um, but that's all that it is. It's what we would call a linguistic construct or maybe a social construct, right? We socially, using language, agree that this is a category. But it could, if you're a nominalist, it's a category that's completely arbitrary and invented by the human mind. It's not real in the sense that it has some absolute reality that is separate from our own human knowledge. But if you're going to be a realist like Thomas Aquinas, then the answer is no, no, no. There, there must be something about a dog that defines it as being a dog. And his simple argument for that, if we call this simple at all, is simply just to say that if this thing must is is if this thing does not have an essence of being a dog, we would not be able to recognize it as a dog. His argument is that even as children, when we are learning that all of these different animals have something in common that make them recognizable as dogs so that we can actually learn the category and correctly call them dogs when they're dogs and call them something else when they are not dogs. It's, um, that there's actually some essence that we're learning, that we're picking up. And even if we can't really verbalize what that particular essence is, it nevertheless must be something that's real, something that's really in the dog and part of the dog. Uh, otherwise, it would not be recognizable as such. So Aquinas is basically saying that yes, all of these animals have have a lot of unique char characteristics, what we, what he calls particular characteristics, right? Their, their size, their shape, their color, the hair texture, the shape of their snout, the length of their tail, the way that they move, the way that they bark, will all be particular, that is distinct and unique to each breed. But nevertheless, there must also be something that would be, would, we would call an essential quality, right? So every object, and this is the crucial part of Thomas Aquinas here, Every object, so underline this, let me say it again, every object has both an essential quality that defines what it is and a particular quality that makes it unique from other individuals, right? Just like humans, right? Every human has particular qualities that define us in terms of our individuality and uniqueness, but we all have an essential quality that defines our humanity. And Aquinas' argument here is that you cannot reject either of these two things. They have to be bound together. They have to be interdependent with one another. An object without a, a particular quality would just be an abstraction, and that can't be a real thing. And that's what Plato was talking about, essentially, is that the, the forms or the essences in the ethereal realm are pure essence without particular qualities, and it's just an abstraction, and that can't be a, a real thing. So, so that's that's why Aquinas doesn't like that. But he says that anything that contains only particular qualities without an essence would not even be a thing either, because it, it wouldn't be recognizable, right? It wouldn't be, you wouldn't be able to recognize it as part of a group, as sharing anything in common with anything else. So in that case, any object has, any recognizable object has to have both essential and particular qualities, or it would not be an object at all. So with that statement, we get, Aquinas is moderate realism. Everything has to have, as I have also written here, both essential and particular qualities. And these two, two kinds of qualities are interdependent, right? You cannot have one without the other. As, again, I have repeated this here. Anything with particular qualities, but no essential qualities would just not be able to exist because it would just not be recognizable. It would not have an identity. But likewise, the converse of that is anything with, with essential qualities, but no particular qualities would just be pure abstraction. And that would also not be uh, something that could exist either. So now that we have that, let's tackle a different kind of question. So we've been talking about things like circularity, dogs and cats and all this sort of things. Let's talk about other kinds of things that we recognize because this particular example is one that has, um, uh, confounded 
uh, psychologists for a long period of time, and even philosophers too. Color. What makes something blue, blue? And, and so we could think, oh, surely it must have something to do with the wavelength of light, right? Um, but we can also realize that uh, there's lots of different wavelengths of light that we all perceive as being blue, yet they are in fact different wavelengths, right? So this is an example of what's called categorical perception, which we have already been talking about. Perceiving dogs, even though they're all different in some way, are still seen as members of the same category. So that's categorical perception. Circles, again, at some point, a circle has, is allowed to have some imperfection and it still is seen as part of the category of things called circles, but beyond some threshold, we would, might start perceiving it as something else, such as maybe being an oval, right? So what about color? What, what, are the, what, it's, what are the thresholds? What are the category boundaries for color? What makes something blue is distinct from something that's green or red? You know, there are all these different shades of blue You've got sky blue, you have navy blue, you have um, uh, aquamarine, you have nice royal blue. What is it that all those things have in common? And what is it that they have that something that's red does not have? It's really hard, right? And if we think about the, the, the actual physics of light, and we talk about the wavelengths of light, we're just thinking in terms of you know, a spectrum, a continuous spectrum of wavelengths here, you know, you go from 400 some nanometers to, to 475 some nanometers and it's all blue. And then all of a sudden you go another five nanometers longer with the wavelength and it becomes green. And, and uh, what changed? It was just an extra five nanometers in the length of the wavelength of light and suddenly that becomes something completely different. There was no physical, you know, crucial physical uh, change in the wavelength, right? The difference between 440 versus 450 nanometers, 10 nanometer difference, leads to no category change. But somehow the difference between 470 and 480 nanometers leads to a category change. Why is there a boundary there that leads from, from blue to blue in one, at one point, but then blue to green at another point? And less perhaps that that boundary is something that's created purely within our own minds. Right, something about the the way our 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 visual receptors respond to the light, and the way in which our brains respond to the different wavelengths and create the category internally. And if we do that, we would need to realize that we have taken ourselves right back to nominalism. Right, that that blue is not an a, in fact an, a property of the object that we are looking at, and neither is green or red or yellow or orange. It is merely a function of our psychological response, which is a function of the way in which our visual systems work. And so we have now taken an anomalist approach to that. But nevertheless, that since we don't like nominalism, or we don't like skepticism, right? Um, we might attempt to take a moderate realist approach to color. So we would say that, okay, yes, all blue things must possess some essential quality that makes them blue but then also have particular qualities that defines the particular shade of blue that they are. But this seems to be somewhat unsatisfactory. We don't, we don't like the, the implied uh, nominalism of, of the ideas uh, and, and moderate realism just seems to say, well, okay, sure, there must be some essential quality, but we, you know, what is it exactly? So this is where Galileo comes in. And Galileo is attempting to, to give us a way in which we could actually not be skeptical, right? that we could actually say it is possible for us to, to scientifically study some things about reality, even if our senses do not always exactly match reality. So Galile Galileo gives us a, a distinction that he talks about here is the difference between primary qualities and secondary qualities. So primary qualities describes the way objects exist. And this means that this means they have properties that we don't necessarily perceive. And then secondary qualities corresponds to the way in which we perceive them, which may not be identical to the properties that the objects actually have. So if we think about color as our example, we would say that color is a secondary quality, right? It exists in the mind. And it is a function 
as we know now, as Galileo did not know, but as we know now, is a function of things such as the way our visual systems work, the particular kinds of uh, cones that we have. But at the same time, it is not completely arbitrary, our, 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 our response to, to these objects, our visual response, because the objects in the world have another property that we could call reflectance, right? They, they, when, when you shine light on an object, it will absorb some of those wavelengths and it reflects other wavelengths. And the particular way in which it absorbs and reflects wavelengths has a very important relationship to the color that we see. So even though color is not a property of the object, it's a property of the, of the mind, and that makes it a secondary quality, it still can be connected to the object, right? Even though it's not the same. So there is a dualism here, I hope that you see, right? That what's happening in the mind can be connected to objects in the world, but it is not the same. So the objects have primary qualities, they have their real physical qualities, and then in the mind, we have our experiences of those qualities, which are not the same, even though they might be related in ways, right? Galileo really didn't spend a lot of time talking about um, color. He was really interested in motion because as you know, as an astronomer, he was interested in planetary motion and, and he was studying the, the, the paths of the stars and other, and other planets of the solar system and the earth around the sun and all that. And even on earth, he was studying motion. He studied uh, um, the projectile motion. And he would note, for example, that if you follow the trajectory of a, of a cannonball, it, it very closely mirrors the path of a parabola in space, right? And we have a mathematical equation that describes the trajectory of a parabola. But one of the things that Galileo noted is that the actual trajectory of a cannonball didn't perfectly follow the parabolic trajectory, but it approximated, it was close. So again, the argument is that what, what Galileo is saying here is that there's the difference there between the primary and the secondary quality, that the parabolic trajectory represents kind of like what it was really doing, and the secondary quality represents the way we can experience it, which is somehow less than perfect. Maybe there's a little reminiscent uh, to Plato here as well, that distinction between kind of a perfection behind the scenes and reality, right? But we can't see it. So here's an example of breaking that down. So we can talk about, you know, the second point here, motion, actual motion versus perceived motion is kind of what Galileo was getting at there when with this talk of par parabolas and projectile motion. But the third one, right, color, right? So on the left-hand side, we have the primary quality reflectance. Objects just reflect light but in the mind that becomes color. The same could be applied to the fourth one down, right? Sound and vibration. So a, a vibration, uh, you know, is, is really just the idea that sound is a wave, right? When two things collide, I clap my hands, right? What happens when I clap my hands is that I'm compressing the air between them, and then I create a vibration that travels through the air, an air pressure wave. Uh, that, that is traveling through the air and it eventually enters into your ear, which vibrates the eardrum. If you know your basic ear anatomy, it vibrates the eardrum. And then behind the ear, you have those three bones, the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. So again, each one of those three bones vibrates. That vibratory wave travels into the cochlea of the inner ear and it causes a vibration of the basilar membrane. Embedded within the basilar membrane, you have hair cells, your, your actual auditory neurons. So those vibrate as well. And then, of course, that causes a, a vibratory pattern in the auditory nerve, which then is transmitted to the midbrain and up into the brain. So now you have a, a vibratory pattern in the auditory cortex. But that's all descriptive in terms of vibratory patterns. Where does sound come in? It's the idea, of course, is that we're going to jump from vibration. At some point, this jumps from this physical vibratory pattern into a psychological experience of, oh, I hear someone clapping their hands, right? So it became, it went from a vibration to a sound. And sounds have qualities that are not quite the same as vibrations, right? That we can describe sound in terms of its loudness or its pitch, its high pitched or low pitched, for example. But that's not the same as uh, the frequency of vibration or the amplitude of vibration. Likewise, the last one down here, your sense of taste and smell is a function of the chemical composition of something. We could say that something 
is like citric acid, for example, is acidic, but it tastes sour. Right? So sourness is not the same as acidity. Acidity is more of a chemical measurement in terms of pH. Sourness is sourness is the psychological experience of that quality. So primary and secondary qualities are related to each other, but they are qualitatively not the same. Right? Which also gets us to that old philosophical chestnut here. So we see the dualism, right? Primary and secondary are related, but qualitatively not the same. That old chestnut is, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? And well, I guess the answer to that question depends on whether you really wanna believe what Galileo is talking about here in this kind of dualist idea. Because if we say that what's happening is the tree, we're not denying the tree existed, right? A tree was there, it falls, it creates a vibration that travels through the air. But unless there is a, a listener, right? So the conscious person or animal in that environment that can detect those uh, vibrations with their ears and then have an experience, it does, never, it does not ever become a sound, right? So unless it can actually jump from a physical vibrat vibratory process to becoming a sound in the mind of someone in that, in that environment, it is the answer to this question is no, right? If a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? No, but that's based on the assumption as Galileo has given us that sound and vibrations are not at all the same thing. Again, they are qualitatively distinct from each other. Keep in mind, we don't have to agree. We could be a materialist monist, right? That's where you're only having one kind of reality. And now what you're gonna say is that the sound is a vibration. Right? There is no separate psychological reality independent of these physical vibrations. It's all just physical vibrations that are transmitted from the environment into the brain, and it's all a physical process. And so in that case, your answer to this would be yes. That's not what we hear most of the time. When we talk about this kind of question, it's usually a question that's designed to reinforce dualistic thinking. But if you don't want to be a dualist, you could say no to that. But keep in mind that what Galileo is doing is he's actually trying to find a way in which we could justify the fact that our internal psychological experiences don't seem to match reality, but he believes that they're still connected to reality, right? The idea is that even though the pitch of a sound is not the same thing as a vibration, it still has a very important relationship to the vibration because we know that the frequency of the vibration has a pretty specific relationship to our perceived pitch, right? High frequencies mean higher pitch. So even though there's a qualitative distinction, there's a quantitative resemblance, right? That, 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 that as, as the frequency changes, pitch changes in systematic ways. And so we could find a way of suggesting that, okay, yes, even though they're different from each other, maybe there's a mathematical way in which they could still be connected, a quantitative mathematical connection between primary and secondary qualities. In fact, that's gonna be one of our first branches of psychology. We're not gonna to get to that until chapter seven, but it's called psychophysics, right? Psychophysics is the study of that kind of quantitative mathematical mapping between psychological reactions to physical stimuli, right? So how does the frequency of a tone affect perception of pitch? And is there a mathematical relationship that can be formulated for that? And that would be a psychophysical function. And that's what we're gonna see people trying to do in the earliest days of experimental psychology in the early to mid 1800s. We're gonna be doing stuff like that. It's called psychophysics. In fact, we still do psychophysics in modern psychology. Not quite as popular as other areas, but nevertheless, this is setting us up to get there. But we still have lots of other things to talk about before we get to chapter seven. That is the end, however, of chapter three.